Taking a world you've created and making it feel small is a powerful way to enhance immersion in film and games. There are scenes in popular films like Ant-Man, The Social Network, and Game Night that do this and it pulls us in strongly. And there's also games like Tiny Glade, Octopath Traveler, and Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening that use this as a constant narrative element. In this video, I share my journey in recreating the tilt shift effect in Reshade. In macro photography, which captures small things up close, the depth of field or the area where things are in focus is very narrow. The way you would fake it in something like Photoshop where you have a photo is you would just blur the bottom and the tops of an image. For film and games where we need something more realistic, we have to accurately simulate depth of field. I started by refreshing my memory on blurring using the box blur. This is the most simple blur. For every pixel, you sample a neighborhood around it, a square neighborhood. You sum those samples, and then you take the average of those samples. So the box blur is basically an average of a neighborhood of samples. If you do that for every pixel in a screen, you get a sort of blur, but it looks kind of blocky somehow. So the next step was to try the Gaussian blur. Instead of just taking the average of a neighborhood of pixels, you take the weighted average and that weighting comes from a Gaussian distribution curve which has a roll off, it's like a bell curve. So pixels closer to the original pixel are weighted more or they contribute more to the sum and then you divide the sum by the sum of the weights and then you get a weighted average and that gives you a blur that's actually smooth instead of just blocky. After that to actually do the depth of field I used a Raymart scene and I found the depth for it. I saved the depth in, a, in the alpha channel and then I actually played with the depth so that it could start further into the scene and have either side of that depth be positive from zero to positive. And then, and then I used that to drive how much blur there should be for that pixel in the image. And that gave us this result, which as you can see, there's something wrong with it. The background seems to blur properly, but in the foreground, the things that are, are blurred because they're too close, it's like it cuts, is like a cut off where the object itself is blurred, but the blur doesn't extend beyond the object into the background, which is what we want. Another thing I learned that day is that tilt shifting isn't just shallow depth of field. It's much more interesting than that. Here is a camera, and here is a point in the world that it's currently focusing on. So what's going on basically is you have rays coming from, let's say this object and they are going off into the world and they're hitting the sensor. And if we're lucky and it's in focus, then all of the rays from this object are hitting at the exact same point on the sensor. If we had another point like this and this point was in focus, then this point would not be in focus. We would see something like this and then maybe it would be like intersecting here further back. If we wanted both of these points to be in focus, what a tilt shift camera lets us do, or a tilt shift lens, is it lets us tilt the lens of the camera so that both of these points become in focus and the line of the focus plane moves from here to here. So, so by the end of day one, I wasn't exactly sure how I would use the shine fluke principle to create an actual tilt shift effect in a shader. And I kind of put that off to the side as like a maybe. Uh, but what I did find was an article about Doom 2016 that went into how they created the depth of field effect. And it basically explained in two paragraphs all the issues that I was having and why and how I could solve them. So the next day, I woke up with an idea. I thought, if I could have a plane in the game, in Reshade, and know what every point in the world's distance was to that plane, then I could blur those points in the world based on their distance to the plane. So I could rotate the plane around the world and have that be the tilt shift effect. But um, my first attempt at the math for this was completely off. And so after that, I had to put it away again for a bit. So let's talk about that Doom 2016 article. In the article, they mentioned that one of the things a lot of people do wrong when they're trying to do depth of field is they use Gaussian blur, which I did. Uh, what you're supposed to use is a, another type of blur called the bokeh blur. Here's a shot I took with a macro lens of a bag of red crushed uh, dried peppers. As you can see, everywhere where it's out of focus, instead of just being blurred, there are these circular uh, specks of light as well. That's bokeh blur. 
how can we mimic this bokeh blur instead? If you remember in day one, I made a box blur, which is where you sample a square neighborhood of pixels around the main pixel. To get a bokeh blur, we have to do a circular neighborhood. So we're gonna have a, a outer for loop that's gonna go around in a circle and then the inner for loop that's gonna go and take samples moving outwards. And then we're gonna, we're gonna weight those each of those samples by how far out we went. So that gives us these pretty uh, circles of light uh, all around the image and it's blurred clearly, uh, but I prefer something that looks more like rings. And to do that, we just have to shift the weights using the pow function and we can get it so that the weights increase as you move out to the edges of the circles. Then I learned that the sampling that I was using has two main problems. The first one is that because the samples are regular, it's like we're going along the, the hands of a clock to do our samples, there's another artifact that it can suffer, which is very similar to the box blur being blocky and repeating. It can also be repeating. One solution to this repeating artifact is to just sample randomly. Because if you sample randomly, at least around a certain neighborhood, there won't be any chance of repetition. The problem with this is it can look grainy. A better solution is something called Poisson disk sampling. It's a mix of random and ordered sampling where you have random samples in a unit circle, in a disk, but they have to follow the specific rule. And that rule is that they none of the samples can be closer than than a certain distance to any of the other samples. So that gives you something that's random, but it's orderly enough that you avoid these repeating artifacts and the grainy artifacts. After that, I went to the gym and when I came back from the gym, it was really hot in my room and I didn't feel like doing any more coding. So instead, I just did some research on my phone and I found another solution, a better, way better solution to the plane thing, the plane rotation thing. We have our screen that we are sitting behind and we're looking into the screen and these are the pixels in the screen. And for each pixel, we need to calculate a ray going into the world because that's gonna allow us to intersect it and know where it is and then send that information back to the pixel and color it accordingly. So we have a ray, which we can calculate or describe as ray origin plus ray direction times some distance into the, into the ray. Now, if you want to find a specific point on the ray, we set up the equation like this point. Let's move away from that for a second. If we have a plane in the world and we want to describe that plane, we can describe it as a normal and some point P zero. So if we had another point on the plane, we can call this P and we drew a vector from P zero and P that vector would also be perpendicular to the normal. So we can describe this idea using this equation, the dot product of the plane's normal and a vector between the point on the plane and some other point should equal zero because they're perpendicular. And if we move back over here, we can also describe this as ray origin plus ray direction times T minus P equals zero. So now that we have two equations that are equaling zero, we can put them together and we can solve for T. And that solution for T that we plug back in here will tell us where along that ray direction we are hitting the plane. So day three was a very rough day. And just to explain how the Doom 2016 blur was supposed to work, you have things blurred because they're far, things blurred because they're really close, and things that are in focus. And each of those require a separate set of logic things that are far first you have to mask anything that's not far so you get an image with far things and just black where it's not far and then you're supposed to blur just the things that are far if it's not far you don't blur so on a gpu there's logic involved because you don't want pixels that are far to blur things that are near into themselves and you don't want pixels that are near which are going to be black to blur at all okay then for things that are near there's another set of logic. What I understood from the Doom 2016 article is that you want to mask out everything that's not near. So all the things that are in focus or far, those should be black and you just have the near stuff. And then what you want to do is you want all the stuff that's far or in focus where it's black. Those things should blur from the near section and things that are near should also blur from only the near section, but not from far. That's because when you look at, for instance, your hand in front of your face, you can see 
your hand being blurred onto the background, but you can't see things from the background being blurred on top of your hand. That wouldn't make sense because the light is further back. That was the logic that I was trying to do and implement on top of having way too many passes and having way too much code in general. By the end of day three, what I realized is I need to slow down and refactor and learn more about the internals of reshade to understand what I'm doing. Now on day four, before I even went into refactoring, what I really wanted to do was make some snippets in VS Code of all of these UI elements and other important functions that I'm always using in Reshade so that I never had to like look that stuff up again. I made a bunch of snippets, did the research, and now I have that for forever for any of my projects. After that, I separated my code into a bunch of modules, plain math for the UI elements, for the depth of field code, etc. And I had modules into the main code. After reorganizing things and separating things into modules, that naturally led to refactoring that main piece that I was working on with all the passes. So I had just one pass that I was focused on, and that was the far pass. So I cleaned up the logic of the far pass, I got that working. I did the same thing with the near pass, and I got that working. And then I tried to put the two together, and I ended up with this weird halo effect. It, it looked as if there was an overlap of the two passes just around the characters and just around things where the far plane and the near plane met in, in pixel space, we can call it. So the rest of my day was banging my head against the wall trying to understand how to fix that. And the idea that I came up with was figure out how much blur is coming from the near plane off into the far plane. And the way that I thought to do that was alpha compositing. You'll see alpha compositing in a lot of shaders on Shader Toy that do clouds because it's a way to keep track of how much blurring has happened and then add that, add the color based on that much blur. So currently we have a blurred background, a blurred foreground, and where those two things meet, there's an outline. And when I increase the blur radius, we get this weird thing happening. So let's recap because we know we can mask the foreground out and have just the background and blur the background just fine. We know we can mask the background and have the foreground, but there's this weird outline that shows up when those two things meet. And yes, I can see when I try to increase the blur on the foreground, it's giving us a really weird result. And it's funny because if I was writing a paint shader, this might be excellent, but I'm not, so it's not. So I tried returning some different things, like I created a sort of alpha calculation where I would just return the weights and I got this. This one is using the number of samples that hit the foreground to color the image. And I also tried using the radius of the samples as the weights and returning those. So then I went back to the layer masks and just the near layer mask and I realized that there's a weird like almost one pixel outline around any of the near stuff uh, when it meets the far stuff. So I tried it with another game with Resident Evil Village and there was a similar thing even worse actually. So that was a big problem I needed to fix. Then I discovered a game changer. The way I was writing reshade shaders is using one technique with multiple passes and in each pass we use something called the color semantic and you apply it to a texture and the special property this has is as you move from pass to pass in one technique effects stack on this variable barrel distortion chromatic aberration vignette and at the end of all the passes in the technique that is the output that you pass there was another shader that did a DOF in two passes, and I discovered they have two techniques in the same shader file. They have a far and a near, two depth of field effects happening. One is for the far plane or the far focus area, and then another one on top is for the near focus area. And the way that they did that was using something called the back buffer. And the back buffer is the frame data at the beginning of the frame before any techniques are applied. So even if you have multiple techniques and passes in each of those techniques, if you call back buffer in any of those techniques, you still get the original frame information. The way they applied depth of field is like this. They applied far field blur just to the area that is in the far field. Any other areas, they call the back buffer and return the original image. For the near field area, call the back buffer and use that to apply blur to the near field. But for the far field, call the far field area and don't blur it, 
but use it samples, weight them, and sum them. So in the end, you get what I was hoping for, which is a weighted sum of the unblurred areas and the blurred areas that are summed together to give you however much blur there should be in these areas that are kind of in between. Once I had the blur working, there was still a weird, very thin outline between where the foreground and the background met. That's because if we we're sampling for the near field and we were in the far field, I tried to be cheap and just exit early. But what you have to do is still collect weighted samples to sum so that when you get the final sum, everything is smooth. Once I got that working, there was nothing to distract me from this magical depth of field effect. It became even more magical when this deer suddenly walked right up to me. Um, it might be just the way that the AI is programmed here. After that, I just needed to add the plane so that I could rotate it and use that to affect the depth of field. So I added the plane um, into the scene and I added UI elements for the normal, for rotations of the normal. I added rotation matrices and I applied those rotations to the normal of the plane. Then I came out with this where it's just blue. It's just shades of blue. The normal of the plane, what the normal is initialized to is 001, zero red, zero green, and, and one blue. What was happening was the rotations were only affecting the Z value and I didn't know why. So I tried passing in the UI angles and that seemed to show up properly. I had a feeling that it might have to do with the fact that if you start with just one component and try to do rotations, it has nothing else to pick up on to properly calculate the other components. What I realized though, is if I just don't have the Z rotation and I have the Y and the X rotation only, those rotations still work fairly well. So I ended up just using those two and I put the plane in and I colored the plane so that you could see it. And there we have the plane. And then I turned on the depth of field effect. And just by using the UI elements that I added, I was able to reduce the narrow, the field of view and rotate it. Then it was the moment of truth. When I leave the plane debug mode and close the UI and look at the scene, will it look like a tilt shift effect? Will it look like a miniaturization effect? Will I be satisfied? I was already really satisfied with just the deer scene with the depth of field, but this is excellent. It definitely feels like a miniaturization. There was a lot of tweaking involved to get used to how the camera angles affected the scene, how the plane interacted with the scene, and to just adjust things to make it look nice. And it was actually a lot of fun. I wasn't sure how much of a difference it would make when going this far back with the camera, the characters are already so small, but I have the plane on a diagonal so that it cuts through the characters. So anything beyond it is blurred and everything close to us is also blurred and it looks pretty decent. This is my favorite setup. We have a natural scene with grass in the foreground that's getting blurred heavily. And also in the background, we have mountains and sky also blurred heavily. I just have the plane horizontal to the ground and close to the midline of the character so that everything above and below is blurred well. The code for this project and many of the other projects on my channel will be available on my Patreon under the source code tier. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.